you know, with the teaching, I'd like to just show you two photos of the place so you can get a kind of a taste for where I'm sitting right now. So let me do the screen sharing. So that's a, a photo of the place. I'm sitting here on this wall. Yeah, and this is a, you know, place which is um, made with handmade uh, clay paint. And it's a sanctuary, you know, for all of those who'd like to reflect more deeply on the current contemporary challenges we are facing here on the planet. And, you know, just as the Buddha has been uh, touching the earth, you know, in the night of his awakening, I also think it is really very, very important to remember, you know, where we come from and that we really cannot forget that if we want to take advantage, you know, of the opportunity of being born as a human being and be able to practice. So show you a second picture and then we can, that's the second one, screen share again. Here we go. Gives you a little feeling of the space. And just, you know, using art and using, you know, the um, symbolism and more than the thinking mind, you know, as a portal into the Dhamma. Because it's difficult enough, you know, to open our minds to that which is liberating and to have a space, you know, which is supporting that can be bringing in a different um, capacity, which we haven't yet connected with in ourselves. And, you know, before we go further, I'd like to just Ask, you know, if you want to write a few words into the chat, how you are right now. And if you write it into the chat, then I can um, read it out. Or you can also unmute yourself and, and speak it out. Somebody say, hey, I remember you as well at Amaravati, Richard. Hi, Richard. You can either write in the chat or unmute yourself if that's what something you want to do. Hello, um, Frida is my name. I'm living in Ireland and just to say hello and that I'm very, very well at the moment. And it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to see you. Yeah. Thank you and everyone. Thank you. And Sean says, tired but glad to be here. So just contributing something into the space, you know, because we are creating this together. It's a community. Kerdwin, happy to see you here, Aya. Hi, Kerdwin. Rachel, I feel moved as we so urgently need to bring, be with everything of the earth. Yeah. And Karim, I was at the online retreat you did with Tanisra at Spirit Rock when you announced the Aloka Earth Room. Good to see the pictures. Thank you, Karim and Shirley. Hi. In a good space. So happy to see you, Aya. Also good to see Derek. Happy to be with you all. And Bea says, my heart is full of joy to meeting you. I follow your YouTube channel, Meta, to you. Ruth says... From Belfast, lovely to be here. She's a little overwhelmed, but happy to be here. Florian, hello, everybody from Switzerland. Hello, Florian. Derek, great to see everyone again. Shirley. Okay, so maybe that's enough for now. 
And Kay says, I'm feeling very calm tonight and love seeing the interesting patterns on your lovely wall. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just let's arrive in the space. You know, and allow your mind to drop into your heart. And then, you know, your heart resting in the body. And the body resting on the planet as the planet. It's like Russian dolls in a way, you know. And allow, you know, your breath to take you into the body. And sensing the gravity, you know, which gently pulls us towards the ground. Even if you're sitting in a high rise building, still operating. Just landing here in the Zoom room. You know, knowing that we are the building this group together just for one and a half hours. And before coming here to our meeting today, I was taking part uh, in an online gathering, uh, which, you know, with, with over 800 people actually, which is a, a, a training course by a Nigerian academic called Bio Akumulafe. And he has coined the line, you know, which I have been using as a title for my. Uh, Dharma reflection tonight. And I just see Karim was there too. Yes, Karim. It was a lot of people. And so I used the quote, times are urgent, let us slow down. Times are urgent, let us slow down. You know, so that we notice the patterns, you know, from which we are, you know, judging everything, perceiving everything, everything which is underlying that which we consider to be me, a lot of it is unconscious. 
and you know, and as we are awakening more and more to the environmental crisis, you know, which is taking place all around us, we start to get a glimmer of the fact, you know, that there's a lot which we have been overlooking. Because, you know, until short, most of us, you know, have been educated to know and perform knowledge that centralizes the human being, you know, and the individual in relation to everything else. And, and this narrative is now starting to die. As we are, you know, noticing that more and more kind of cracks are opening up in this old narrative because it's no longer really up to the job. It is not capable, you know, to be functioning as a foundation for our culture and for our civilization. And we need to, you know, need to really slow down in order to take that in because it's such a fundamental shift. It's a sea change. It's huge. So we need to start all over again, you know, and question so many of the assumptions from which we are operating from. And, you know, and to just, you know, be really clear that the planet isn't in a crisis. It's us, it's our species, which is in a crisis. And inside of that crisis, it pulls down a lot of other species as well. The planet can totally take care of itself and it will just get rid of us, you know, if we are getting too much of a nuisance. So that's something, uh, you know, to really allow to sink in. So we are, you know, at the threshold of a lot of uncertainty and unknowingness. And that's why it's so urgent, you know, to slow down and take stock of what has come before and what, you know, what needs to be done differently. And having a you know, practice like the practice we have is just a very good fortune to have, you know, some technologies, you know, which can help us to steady our minds and not turn away from what is happening. I think that's one of the great blessings of the Buddhist practice, which we have all received already. And uh, so, you know, being, being part of a civilization which ha has believed <clears throat> or is still believing, you know, to be on a royal road to truth through science and technology only. You know, and centralizing everything around how it serves us. And we really urgently need to unlearn it. But before we can unlearn it, we need to actually understand that this is what is underpinning all of our thought processes. So I, I consider the, the current crisis to be like a crisis of humility, not a crisis, you know, of ecology. It's a crisis of humility, which happens, you know, in the human heart, in the human mind. And uh, we can apply practices, you know, to attune to what is needed right now. And I think the most important thing is to need to acknowledge that the planet is an intelligent living being and we are part of it. And there is a particular one Buddhist practice, you know, which very clearly um, supports that recognition. And it's a practice in the first Satipatthana, the first establishment of mindfulness, and it's called the elements meditation. And there's different versions of it, you know, version on the four elements, five elements or six elements. 
So that's one very basic practice, you know, which is not difficult to do, but it helps us to uh, enter into the recognition, you know, that we and the planet are not separate. And on the other hand, you know, that's like on a conventional level, it helps with that understanding. And on an ultimate level, it is actually an, a portal into understanding not self or emptiness. You know, that all phenomena on this planet, is it a car, a house, a body, a tree? All phenomena, they do not exist from their own side, but they are processes, you know, which are arising and ceasing like the waves on the top of the ocean. They're all made out of water. And, you know, for a certain amount of time, they appear to exist separately, but it's just a movement which is happening. And this, this uh, elements meditation can really help us to enter into that different way of looking at ourselves. And, you know, that uh, can be surprisingly enriching on the one hand and also confusing on the other hand, you know, like coming back to the ground, going on our knees, you know, and, and, and really taking in the fact that we are never cutting the umbilical cord towards the planet, but we are in constant exchange and utterly dependent on it, you know. So that, that really forces us to give up that sense of mastery, you know, which our civilization has tried to hold up, you know, over the centuries. And now we have really hit the wall with the climate crisis because we can see, you know, the way how we have been conducting ourselves, have been conducting our business, has created this huge backlash, you know, which we didn't really think about for a long time. And then, you know, people started to speak up, like, in the last century already, you know, like, in the 1950s. But there was, they were, like, just sidelined as being kind of a bit, you know, weird or hysterical or something like that. And then more and more people were joining in and joining in and joining in. And now, finally, there's no more doubt that that's what's happening. So to slow down and listen deeply. And I've brought a quote here, you know, from Ajahn Chah, who is the, uh, you know, founder of the Thai forest tradition, which took really well root in the UK, Amaravati and Chitas Buddhist monasteries and Hanham and Hartridge. So very, very successful group, you know, of uh, monastics. And I have here a quote from Ajahn Pasano, he says, I remember Ajahn Chah saying one time, addressing the issue of wanting to really push and then feeling fr frustrated by that. And he said, can you just learn to practice like an earthworm? They can't know where they are going. They are just going on with their head down. Just go, just have earthworm practice, but keep moving keep being constant, keep being consistent. So, you know, that, that, that quality of patient perseverance and being okay with not knowing actually where it's going. This is exactly uh, the quality, you know, we need to um, cultivate. Not knowing, you know, where all of this is going, you know, with... Uh, our civilization, you know, meeting its limits and can no longer uh, push in the same way for mastery and for extraction and individualism, capitalism, all of those isms and all of those um, you know, splitting into haves and have not and all of those approaches you know which have been partial and now have found a very strong stop sign you know 
because it starts no longer to make sense. I think this is a time, you know, when we can remember our practice and, uh, you know, take the courage that we do have what it takes, you know, to question all of this. And, you know, come back to what's really true, you know, is that we are always already fully embedded in the web of life. We just forgot it, you know, because our cultures have been pushing for something else. They have been pushing for emancipation from limitations have been pushing, you know, do not get old and do not be sick and do not, you know, can live forever. You can upload your mind somewhere and then or can go to live on Mars. So all of those crazy ideas, you know. And now we have to just say, okay, that was, you know, that was a bit of an immature approach. And now we need to stop with that stuff and do something which is much more real, come back to the ground by just really investigating the body because the body is always with us. You know, it's, we don't need to do anything special. We need to really start there, start at the very beginning, start at, you know, what is so much in the center of our lives. You know, our bodies require a lot of uh, care. You know, we need to have houses and cars and clothes and health insurance and, so many things we need to do just in order to um, deal with the body. So just pay attention to that and uh, trust, you know, that if we go deeper into that, which is already happening, that we will be able to connect with a much vaster intelligence than just like what the thinking mind can, um, you know, come up with. The intelligence, you know, which we call the Dharma, which is the, you know, natural truth, which is always already happening. We are embedded in it. And, uh, you know, what I really like about the fact is that the word, you know, for, for soil, one word for that is humus. And the word humus and humility and human, they all start with the same three letters. So we are, you know, we are really made of earth. And we need to really embrace that and that brings us, you know, to the much needed humility, which we need to have at this time in history, where we need to realize, you know, that we can't turn away from the truth of what our body needs. Because if we, if we don't have a body, we can't really practice. So if we disrespect the body, the embodiment, the practice is not going to flourish. So, and that takes humility, you know, to acknowledge that. And, you know, and the environmental situation is basically, you know, forcing us to turn back onto ourselves. After, you know, having been trying to to escape all of this through science and technology and now saying, no, you know, that has its limits. We need to come back and connect with the simplicity of the fact, you know, that us, our bodies and the planet are one and the same process. And what we do to the planet, we do to ourselves. Yeah, and that's like just an amazing insight, you know, when we st when that starts to dawn on ourselves. It's like a coming home again, you know. And there's a beauty in that and the sense of uh, 
slowing down, which just automatically becomes available because there's the, the cl clarity and we can't run away from it. And you know, I really consider it as, a, as an evolutionary task you know, for our species as we are standing on an evolutionary threshold where you know, our species and other species before us have been experienced that since the beginning of the development of this planet, again and again, you know, there were those uh, difficult uh, integrations which had to occur in order for a species to continue or to uh, go extinct. You know, if the species isn't able to do that integration, then it will not be able to continue to be uh, supported, you know, by, by the biosphere. And, and I think, you know, we are on such a point right now and anyone, you know, of us who, who is willing to look at this situation can give a contribution, you know, to, to this um, great task, you know. And it's an it's a honorable task. It's, a, it's an amazing situation and we really consciously be at that threshold. So, you know, the ancestors, you know, which have gone before us and, you know, and some of our ancestors are those elements, you know, which make up the body and, you know, the earth, many, many different ancestors making up the earth layer on the planet, trees and other plant life, animal life, human beings who have been buried in the soil. So this is an enormous, an enormous amount of uh, forebears, you know, which on, 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 on the shoulders of which we are standing right now, you know, and those bodies which we have received which are like biocomputers, which have been developed over billions of years. And we can use the teaching, you know, which is very ancient teaching. It comes to us, you know, from Iron Age India times. We can use this teaching, you know, to tune into the wisdom of the body. So using this very ancient teaching, but seeing it in a different context now, you know, as we are standing on this uh, threshold where our species is at risk to go extinct. And it's really, you know, when we hear this kind of reflection, and then there might be a part of us that just, I just don't want to know about all of that stuff. I just want to meditate, you know, and feel better. You know, that's, I can't really provide that uh, for you, you know, because I feel uh, really very much uh, called, you know, to, to see the practice in a, in a bigger context and not just in an individual uh, well-being, you know, but see it in a much bigger context than that. Because it gives us a sense of um, community, you know, with the more than human world. And that's exactly what we need to develop, you know, to feel a sense of community, not just with our own species or our own family or with the ones we love, but with everybody. Because that's what's really true. And, you know, and what is amazing is, you know, as soon as we are willing, you know, to turn towards this uh, situation in which might, you know, it's an, an enormous uh, situation, but at the same time, as soon as we are starting to turn towards it, uh, new energies are set free, you know, because as soon we are opening up to the bigger picture, the energy of the bigger context is available to us. 
And, you know, as we are making the transition, it is maybe in a little bit choppy and rocky. But as soon as we find our kind of balance with it, our whole life, you know, takes on much more um, depths and much more energy is coming through. So therefore, it's really important to get involved rather than just standing on the edge and kind of shutting, trying to shut down, trying to run away. Even that's also part of it, but opening to that as well. And we always need to start exactly where we are, which is, you know, where you're sitting right now with the body you are sitting in. That's where we get started. You know, as soon as we are, you know, basically entering the territory through our own bodies, we set free a much greater connectedness and we feeling enriched, you know. And we know that we are not alone in this. We are, we are all together in this. It's a very different way of uh, meeting ourselves. And, you know, starting to sense certain realities, you know, we haven't been able to connect with because we were very much caught up in the very individualistic enterprise, you know, the, uh, practicing in order to feel a little bit better. And this is like more practicing to feel a little bit more real every time, you know, we are sitting down and looking at our experience. And, and keeping moving, you know, like an earthworm who doesn't really know what the result is going to be. But who, you know, is relating to that which is in front of our nose right now. What is, has to be met in the present moment. So, you know, for that, I would like to uh, guide us in a elements meditation, which is a very, you know, early Buddhist practice, a very simple, but very powerful and very uh, timely for all of the questions, you know, we are meeting right now. So, you know, please, you know, find the posture you can sustain for like 30 minutes or so. And you don't have to work hard. You don't have to do anything in particular, you know, just uh, paying attention to what is being said and then allowing your mind to respond. So we're gonna start by checking in with the body and the mind and what are you bringing here, you know, with you? And the motivation, the aspiration why you have come here today. And we are building a capacity to connect to relate with our experience of, of being a body, having a body.
And then you know, we can just start by tapping our teeth together and feeling the hardness of the teeth. And that is, uh, you know, the quality of earth element. It's hardness as opposed to softness and structure. That's what earth element is. So direct experience of it. And we can, you know, sense the hardness or softness of earth element in in our bones. And the teeth are the tips of the bones. If we can just sweep, you know, from the top of the head. We're starting on the top of the head. Bones. Earth element. And then from the head, we come to the neck. Bones, earth element. Then from the neck to the shoulders, bones, earth element. Then the upper arms, bones, earth element. Lower arms. Bones, earth element. The hands. Bones, earth element. Torso with the spine and the rib cage, bones, earth element. The hips, the pelvis, bones, earth element. The legs, bones, earth element. And the feet, bones, earth element. This whole body is permeated by earth element. Earth element internally and earth element externally as the rocks and the mountains is exactly the same earth element. Earth element is empty, empty of a self. And if we don't, you know, ingest earth element as food for one or two months, the body is going to shut down. It can't sustain itself. We never cut the umbilical cord towards the planet. It always has to be an exchange you know, of eating and going to the bathroom. And then in order for earth element to take for a form, it needs to also have cohesion. And that brings us to the water element, which stands for cohesion, wetness, and fluidity. And we can be aware of it in the flesh, you know, which is permeated by liquids. And the body you know, consists 75% of water element water. So let us sweep now from the bottom of the feet, you know, sensing the softness of the flesh, which is permeated by water. And then we are sweeping up over the legs, flesh, water element. 
to the hips, the pelvis, flesh, water element. The torso, flesh, water element. Hands, flesh, water element. Arms, flesh, water element. Shoulders, flesh, water element. Neck, flesh, water element. The head, flesh, water element. This whole body is permeated by water element. Water element internally and water element externally in the rivers and the lakes, rains, the oceans is exactly the same water element. Water element is empty, empty of a self. And if we don't take in water element through drinking for five days or so, the body is going to shut down. And in order for water element, you know, to form a body, it needs to have a certain temperature. If it's too cold, it freezes. If it's too hot, it evaporates. And that brings us to the next element, which is the fire element, which stands for heat versus cold. And we can become aware of it on the skin, you know, where the skin meets the air around us. Or maybe in the mouth also, we can sense the heat or under our arms. So sweeping down from the top of the head, skin, fire element.
the neck, skin, fire element. Shoulders, skin, fire element. Torso, skin, fire element. Hips, skin, fire element. Legs, skin, fire element. And the feet, skin, fire element. This whole body is permeated by fire element. Fire element internally and fire element externally. It comes from the sun. It's exactly the same fire element. Fire element is empty, empty of a self. And the heat of the filament is, uh, you know, the result of friction. And that takes us to the next element, the wind element, which, you know, is experiences expansion and contraction, pressure. We can become aware of it in the breathing process. And you know, if we are not breathing for three to seven minutes, depending on how we are trained, then uh, the body is going to shut down. We are constantly in exchange with the planet, with those elements. And we never cut the umbilical cord. The body and the planet are one process. And that's the same for everyone. The trees, the all the animals. all the plants.
And just checking in with yourself, you know, what does that bring up in you as you are starting to notice this uh, truth, you know, that the body and the planet are one and the same process. It's like waves on the top of the ocean. The body appears, you know, as a wave, but it's always water at the same time. Water element, earth element, fire element, wind element, and space element, which is also something we can experience. You know, we are sitting in space and there is this cavity in the body, the womb, the mouth, the ears. The space is limitless, you know, it doesn't end at the walls of the room we are sitting in. And, you know, we can listen into that space. Listening to the silence. And then we let it go of the space element, the spaciousness, and just becoming aware of that which knows about the space. Awareness. A conscious awareness. Being conscious of awareness. Mm. 
you know, like a mirror becoming conscious of its capacity to reflect effortlessly. And being conscious of that quality, the resting as the knowing of all of this. And the knowing, you know, is the place where we can come back to again and again. And that which is known is constantly changing. Every moment. being present to that constant change. You know, as we are coming to the end of the meditation, just, you know, coming back to sensing the weight of the body, Again, and the gentle pull of gravity. So, you know, now we have uh, some time for clarifying anything of what I have said, maybe, or comments from you, or anything you would like to share. And I think you can either, you know, raise your Zoom hand, I suppose, or write into the chat. And then maybe Manuri or Derek could read out any questions which go into the chat. Yes, if you'd like to raise your digital hand, then I will invite you to speak one by one. And if not, if you write in the chat box, it will remain anonymous and I will read out the question.
maybe I can start with the first question. Yes, please, Derek. Um, so thank you very much for the talk. And I want to stay, say before I start my question that I am very much in agreement with what you say, but there is a, 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 a sutta which says that if form were controllable, then we'd be able to say to it, please be like this, or please don't be like that. But be because form isn't controllable, we can't say to it to be like this or to be like that. I'm just wondering to what extent you think we have control over the, the aspects of climate change with regards to the physical earth and what you think we could do within our limited um, means to improve the situation? I mean, you know, it's very clear that it has a lot to do with the amount of uh, carbon, you know, which is released into the atmosphere by the technologies, you know, we are maintaining on the planet. So we just need to change those, you know. And this is an enormous task, yes, but, you know, we cannot directly have an impact on form, but we can have, we have an impact on causes and conditions, you know. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to cultivate our minds at all, you know, if we wouldn't have through setting the right causes and conditions into place, which means, you know, training our minds, keeping the precepts, studying the teachings, practicing regularly, then over time, you know, the mind changes. Otherwise, you wouldn't practice either, isn't it? And the same is with every with everything else in nature, you know. If you keep on spewing CO2, carbon in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere has limits, you know, at one point it's saturated to such a degree, you know, that it, it kills off, you know, certain life forms. And, and then if you stop and reverse it, it's the opposite. That's what you can do, you know. Otherwise, liberation would be impossible if there wouldn't be any kind of uh, possibility, you know, to, to put things in a certain direction and then consistently follow through on it, you know. It's just part of the propaganda also, you know, which is made. So to kind of make people feel you know, that individuals are, because we do feel helpless as individuals, because we need to do it together, you know, as a collective. We need to do it all together. And that means, you know, we need to, uh, the narratives which is underlying our civilization needs to change, you know, that which we consider, uh, you know, important, that how our education system works and all of that, that needs to, that's the causes and conditions, you know, which need to be investigated and changed so that then other actions emerge from that, you know. So it's not a small thing, but yeah, this is why it's so important, you know, to, to tune in with the big picture, you know, the, the world views, you know, which exalt the individual, you know, and, and for that matter, you know, the right, worldview, you know, the global north and, you know, the, the marginalizing of many other approaches. And so that means that a widening and the opening up to different ways of uh, looking at life, for example, and diversity simply, you know. So that will bring in that will change causes and conditions. And if causes and conditions change, then phenomena you know, which are rising will also change. That's how we can have an impact. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Shirley, would you like to ask your question? Um, I've got a couple of reflections to make. Um, first of all, thank you for that wonderful meditation. I, uh, I've done that sort of meditation before, but I found it was quite, it was really profound. Um, and this idea of emptiness and yet interconnectedness and feeling 
Um, so that was very beautiful. So, yeah. But I, 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 what Derek said just now resonated with me as well because I have done, I have, um, I've, I've got involved with exile Buddhists and sat. It's, I sit outside Parliament sometimes with Christians, and we just meditate. I don't do anything like gluing myself to anything. Just sort of sitting in the street meditating and or praying if you're a Christian. Um, and I think sometimes think, why do I do it? Because I think we know what needs to be done, and yet those in power don't want to, don't seem to be doing anything. And my feeling is you just do what you can without expecting a result because we don't know. We are earthworms just sort of going along blindly. <laughs> Maybe I'm being very sort of negative, but I think to sort of feel that you can... Yeah, I just sort of carry on doing what I can do without sort of sort of letting go of any um yes obviously there's a wish to change thing but any expectation of change and I don't know whether you feel that's a useful way of uh, contemplating things or whether um you know we should be more proactive thank you I think it is useful you know to just keep on going and have a consistency and and do what we can. I also have sit with a group of people in the street, you know, twice a, a month here, most months here in San Rafael. And I think, yeah, just, you know, do ra raising awareness and do what we can. And knowing, you know, if more people would do this, we mm. could just meet a lot more people, you know. And and it could well be that things need to get worse before people get uh, sufficiently motivated you know and that's just something we need to live with yeah but at the same time do what we can and more we can't do yeah and then also meet with people you know who are on the same wavelength because then we feel inspired and we feel like connected and and nourished you know by that sameness you know I think you're doing exactly the right thing and you know, it just needs millions of people who do this, because then the the you know the people in those the CEOs and the politicians and all of those will need to be forced, you know, to. And some of them, you know, there's more and more clear seeing anyway. I think we are more and more coming to that point where things will shift, you know, if there's enough people. Uh, you know, doing it in whatever way you feel called to do. Everybody has to find out, you know, some go on the street, some sit quietly, but even sitting at home contemplating, you're empowering the making it conscious, you know, in, in, in collective consciousness, you know. And that's how things change, you know, if more and more people join in and think, start to think differently and start to become aware. And at one point, if it gets to a critical mass, it, it will shift, you know. That's how things have happened in the past, you know. There was a time when everybody believed the earth is flat and then no, nobody believes that anymore, just a few people these days, you know. Or, you know, many other things like, yes, the earth is in the center of the solar system and then, uh, you know, Kepler and Galilei said, no, it's not true. And first they wanted to burn them on the stake, you know, and now it's no question anymore. So this is how change happens, you know that more and more people come on board and then it takes a, finds a critical mass and, and it shifts, you know. And we can position ourselves wherever we want to be on that spectrum. I mean, I am clearly, <laughs> I have positioned myself on, on a certain point and wherever I go, when I have an opportunity, I bring it into the teaching because I think it's a very important issue these days. But as I said, you know, the planet isn't in a crisis. It's it's our species which is in a crisis, you know. And we have mastered so many difficult bottlenecks, you know, since this species has showed up on the planet. Why should we not ab be able to master this one as well? Why not? I mean, 
you know, definitely uh, totally worth trying, you know, and at the same time, it's, it's a real uh, very good fuel for practice, you know, because everything what we learn in the practice is com com totally compatible with this situation, you know, we can use it. Good luck, Shirley, that you're also sitting. That's what we are doing too here. We call it sitting for survival. Mm. Thank Just you. being a good ancestor, you know, that's all. Just caring for future generations, at least trying, you know. We don't know what the result's going to be, but you're definitely going to feel better on your deathbed if you tried than if you didn't, you know. And then you don't know because it could have worked, you know, and then you don't know. So why don't you try? And then if it doesn't work, something else is going to work because this, it's not just like up to one individual, you know. This is just like part of this individualistic, you know, worldview which we have. We somehow lost, lost that uh, capacity to feel part of something bigger, you know. And this is why this meditation is so important also, because it, it brings that online again, you know, that we are not alone. Yeah, it, it's a bringing together, you know, of our individual daily life practice with the practice of liberation, you know, and they can go hand in hand. And that's how they become really powerful, you know, if we live from that place, not just like sitting one hour a day and then go about your life in a, in a completely different way. It needs to be one thing, you know, it needs to come together because otherwise it's just always going to be like a hobby or something that doesn't have enough power. Thank you. I would like to read now a comment that's been written in the chat box. Yeah. I am aware of two groups who are helping Mother Earth by helping us humans to raise our awareness in the collective sense. These groups also have ET contact as well, who has come to help us at this time. These groups are called CE5 and Rama. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know anything about those things. And I, I just know we don't need ET contact because it's all so simple, you know. I just we just saw it in the meditation. I don't need an extraterrestrial to come and tell me anything about it. I just know it right now that my body is just not separate from the earth, and that's why I cannot treat the earth like a garbage bit. So I I mean I don't know if there is ET out there but uh, most likely I think so you know and but I have never had any contact and I think it complicates things and it polarizes things even more you know those who believe and those who don't believe I, I just you know whoever feels enriched by this kind of contact I wish them well you know but I don't really um, my life is already complicated enough kind of a thing with all of the terrestrial contacts I have to cultivate, you know, live alone, ex-terrestrial. I think that's what it meant, did it, Tarek? E.T.? I think you're right. I'm not 100% certain. Maybe that person would like to clarify if uh -huh. there's something else. Yeah. slightly different question that I have but yeah. related is do you think if the Buddha were around in human form today that his teachings would reflect climate change and the environmental questions of the day or do you think that he'd focus more on, on 
on the sort of teachings that we find in the suttas? Of course, he would re relate to it. But you know, but you know, there is like two levels of teachings. You know, the more the more lip, the more ultimate teachings. You know, which would be which are timeless. You know, which are always the same. You know, uh, about like anicca dukkha anatta, the four noble truths, and all of that uh, teachings. But there's also teachings about you know where he, particularly in the Anguttara Nikaya, you know where he lists about what it is to be a good householder, you know, what it is to be a good husband, what it is to be a good wife in the in the language of Iron Age India, you know. And today the whole situation about um, the limitations of the biosphere, because there is eight billion people on the planet, I'm sure he would speak to that, yeah. Because it's directly impacting our daily lives, you know. He would speak about recycling and he would speak about you know, down, down there, your consumption. I'm sure he would do that. Yeah. But of course, I, I, I can't, I mean, I, I, I think he would do that. I can't be sure, but I would be surprised if he wouldn't uh, relate to it because he was always very much, you know, uh, in a practical way relating to what was important for people to lead a, a kind of wholesome life, you know. But I think the, you know, the uh, ultimate, core of the teaching is the same, will stay the same, you know, because that won't change, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm. We have approximately eight to ten minutes. So does anybody else have any questions? Okay, another comment in the chat box. Thank you for the teaching. I think we are also a little bit silent because it's so clear. <laughs> so. Please. Thank you, and thank you so much, Aya, um, for your talk and meditation. Um, I'm personally a climate activist. Um, I've been arrested for nonviolent activism ten times. Um, right. And thank you. And <laughs> I've devoted a lot of my life towards that. I'm taking a bit of a break at the moment. Um, and my question to you is kind of a personal, but might resonate with some others. Um, what advice can you give to those of us that care so much about this and are actively doing as much as we can about this, whatever that might be? Um, when kind of those feelings of uh, being kind of lost and is this all worth this arise? And yeah, that you know, the disconnection to it all and thinking, is this the right thing? Actually, maybe I should just quit and just get on with life like everyone else does or that, that's how it feels. No, I mean, you know, I think it's really important to, to uh, you know, connect with others who are doing the same thing, you know. For example, I have, that's why I've, why I've started this earth room, you know, because I want that people who are practicing Buddhists and who are, concerned about the situation that they've come here to this place you know and, and uh, I have uh, an online uh, teaching every Wednesday you know from I think it's from five to six UK time and that's a group you know where people meet and and meditate together and and then on Saturdays people can come here in person the ones who live in the area so I think it's very important to meet with people who are of the same on the same wavelength, you know, so that you don't feel so undernourished and alone. Because I think we need to continue, you know. But also, you know, sometimes you need to take a break. That's part of it, you know. So because you need to include yourself also in the circle of concern, you know, because otherwise you burn out, and that wouldn't help anyone, you know, wouldn't help you wouldn't help the cause. So I think, yeah, we need to keep going, you know, but in, in, in a wise way, you know, where we are also um, resourcing ourselves, 
that is totally necessary. Otherwise, you burn out, and then that's not good, you know. Yeah, but not stopping in no way. I mean, and, and there's so many people. There's so much um, community out there. And also, you know, not it's not just about like action, like action in in terms of in in the world, but it's also like the internal action, you know, of questioning the old narrative and dropping into a deeper reality. Because if you are acting from that new narrative, you know, it's much more, you feel much more in the flow, I think, and not so um, alienated, you know, because if you do it inside of the old narrative, you know, about, you know, the, the old individualistic uh, capitalist, mechanistic old worldview, you know, which sees the world as a machine which needs to be fixed so we can get more benefits out of that machine, you know. You, it's really important to attend to the worldview as well and really practice, you know, and do this kind of meditation so we are more uh, able to let go of of operating from the old, old world view, because then we feel much more um, you know, disempowered and and in the sense of it doesn't make it's 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 useless, you know. Whereas I think if we are really deeply knowing that we and the planet are one, you know, if that if that knowing becomes more and more embodied, you know, then that's the most important thing and how that pans out, you know, on a, on a material level, you know, that's something you really need to let go of because we don't, we don't know how it's going to be. But then I, I look back, you know, on how many, where we are coming from, you know, from the big bang 4 billion years ago. I mean, that was the, such a mess, such a huge chaos, you know? So this, these processes, you know, they are just like quite chaotic and uh, and we can't control them. But the more we are able, you know, to sense into that, uh, we are willing to let go. And then, you know, the most amazing things can happen as well. We just don't know. This is why I spoke about this earthworm practice, you know, because it's, we don't know. But if you have very strong ideas how it should be then you feel much more disempowered you know then if you just don't know then you still is the fear of the uncertainty we need to deal with you know that's also there but you are not alone with that fear you know because i am also you know it's 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 not a doesn't feel super comfortable to not know you know how it's going to be even in two or three years but this is something we need to uh, familiarize ourselves with because I think that's part and parcel of the old worldview which needs to die to think we can control nature. That is at the root of the mess, you know, what we have created through trying to control nature and, you know, fix it how it needs to be, you know, and that. That's the at, at the root, you know, of the problem. Because trying with science and technology, you know, to control nature has led to what where we are now. So we need to learn to be more in the flow and become part of it and not having that expectation of being able to control it, you know. So then if you look at that, you know, because if you feel you know, feel you lost your your energy, you lost your enthusiasm because you are no longer sure about how the result is going to be. Just let go of that, you know. And that will take some time to get used to it because it brings up fear, you know. But then, you know, if you, you know, we learn to work with that fear because we start to also understand, you know, that the fear has something to do with, uh, 
you know, with with just, you know, wanting to to know, you know, and and that's just like part of of an unenlightened human being, you know, and as long as you're not fully enlightened, you're always gonna need something to hold on to, right? And that's why it's a practice also, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, just before we end, I will read out the remaining questions or comments in the chat box. Um, this is referring to the question, the comment earlier. Of course, those ET visitors are simply trying to help people to raise their consciousness collectively to help the world. As happened to them as well at one time, as they ET are concerned about the earth and human beings. Unfortunately, a lot of people think anyone who talks about ET is crazy, but that isn't so. It's the intention of meta that matters. And then yeah, that sounds good. Some other comments or appreciation to you for your talk today. I get a lot of nourishment from these practices. Thank you. I appreciate your optimism about our ability to change the planetary situation. And thank you, Aya, for your thought-provoking talk and for linking Buddhist teaching to this important topic. Thank you very thank much. You. So then we can end now and I hand it back to you, Manuri. It'll come back to me, actually, Aya. I'm going to be giving the Dharma talk. So thank you so much, Aya Sandra for leading such a grounded meditation and sharing such wisdom. I really appreciate your commitment to our connection to the natural world.